So thank you very much for uh, coming for week two of the five weeks of webinars. I am in Dunfanaghy in the beautiful County Donegal, right up in the north on the Atlantic coast. Um, and I'm on lockdown the same as everybody else. But I have to admit, if it wasn't for the health sites, which are, of course, are very serious, I'm truly loving it. Um, it's been a great experience. Imagine getting stranded in paradise like this. It's just, it's just really good. So here's the, the purpose of our webinar for, for this week. This is, what we, this is what we put out as being what we would be doing. Um, a transformation journey has a starting place. Where are you now in the digital economy? This session will provide you an overview of how to define your position, plan your next play, win big in the digital economy. Using tried and tested frameworks, we'll show you that every business who's willing to change, and that is important, can move from a position of simply digitizing what they're doing to creating some serious punching power against competitors. So the first half, we're going to be looking at the digital mindset and what that means and what you've got to understand. And then the second half of the webinar, we'll be looking at that punching power that I mentioned. So um, let's, let's get stuck straight into it. Let's just see um, how this is going to work. So a, last week, you may remember, on the 21st of April, we did the change blocks, and we'll be referring back to that again, building a resilient business. And I'll go back through what we did last week very quickly. And then we will take a look in more detail of what we are going to do this week and the purpose uh, behind learning all of this stuff. So last week, we went through the definition of digital transformation. What is digital transformation? And remember, it was how an organization is built to innovate and reinvent rather than simply enhance and support the traditional methods. Most businesses see the word digital, they digitize, they do a good job, and they should digitize, but they don't transform. The mindset of the leaders is the same. The activities of the people are the same, just on computers. So we need to get past that because the one thing that we've learned from COVID-19 is that we're not going back to the way things were. We then looked at what a resilient business was. And they talk about this from a McKinsey perspective, the management consultancy firm, about being able to enable these technologies, explore agile ways of working and maintaining customer loyalty. We looked at who should be involved in digital transformation. There are three key players, three legs to that stool. It's the technologist, it is the communications expert, and it's the missing leg, the leader, the manager, or decision maker. And the reason that leg is missing is because quite often they see the word digital and outsource it to the technologists. But a technologist is not the person to transform and reshape a business. They certainly have a strong influence, but it's a leader's role to do that. And without having the language, without being bamboozled by the technology, the leaders have to play that step up and take that key function, and they don't. And so we'll be looking at that problem in particular today and how we rectify that from a mindset perspective. We looked last week at digital maturity. I give you a really quick way of doing this. We're going to be looking at a more advanced way this week. And we were able to see where are you now? If you're one or two, competitively disadvantaged or stable, it's time to move. If you're three, you are moving, but maybe not fast enough. And some of the questions came in and said, we're stuck at three. How do we move to four? So many of you are along this spectrum and could easily identify. We looked at the critical components, these five change blocks, mindset and strategy, engagement, innovation, technology and data. And while they're all separate blocks, it's simply to help us understand these blocks are overlapping in, real, in reality, as we'll see. We then went through looking at the problems with strategies is that most of them aren't strategies. They're simply um, a lists, to-do lists. They're not saying what we're going to do less of, what we're going to do more of, and they don't answer questions. We looked at communications, and dependent upon your move in the digital economy, you will have radically different style of communication, which affects your website, it affects your employees, it affects your intranets, it affects all of that communication, dependent upon the move. And we're going to go deep into this for about 15 minutes um, today. And this is going to come, you'll see this getting a little bit more populated, this very diagram, and we're going to go into that in more detail. We looked at culture of innovation. 
innovation is not the ideas box. It's not what Mary put in last week, so we'll give her a bottle of champagne because we thought it was a good idea. In fact, that's the antithesis of innovation. That's just celebrating thought rather than celebrating an outcome that's come from a collaboration of many. Technology adoption is a journey. We can't jump straight into the new and emerging technologies. We have to digitize and then transform. And then we looked at the, the case study of the Scottish bed manufacturer and the kind of insights that we were able to gain from public data within minutes. This is going to come up again. Data is going to come up again. Data comes up all of the time. Our inability to understand the data, and worse than that, it's not the inability to understand the data that's the big problem, it's that we don't have questions to ask of the data. You know, if I were to hold up a spreadsheet and say, what's the answer? Your immediate response would be, what's the question? So without good questions, we can't utilize good data. And where do the good questions come from? Well, they come from the strategy. So all of this stuff overlaps. Okay, let's get into this week's topic and what we're going to do. Quick reminder, last week, 9% of Britain said they wanted to return to normal life once the lockdown was finished. Only 9%. McKinsey and Co. saying gaining even a small competitive advantage during a downturn makes it incredibly difficult for competitors to catch up once the upswing happens. And McKinsey have released a COVID-19 strategy guide. And on the front cover, it says digital strategy in a time of crisis. Now is the time for bold learning at scale. They put education as the number one component to surviving transformation and the crisis of, of, in, in created by COVID-19. They're not even selling greater management consultancy at scale. So the, the point of this is that you're here on this webinar to get education. What has been advised by the great minds is that education is going to be the solution. But I have some good news and alarming news at the same time. We set up and run businesses or join businesses because of our subject matter expertise. So. If you are a chemist, you might join a, pharmacy, a, a pharmaceutical company or a technologist. You might join an IT company or you happen to be in travel and tourism. You may join travel and tourism companies. But the one message that keeps coming out is that your industry expertise is no longer enough. Being good at what you're good at is an expectation. Now, where are people coming from in this? They're coming from it from the perspective that almost any question can now be answered from a digital perspective. Any of these advanced knowledge insights that used to be the preserve of a few are now available to the many. So we need to gain new talents and be perpetually upgrading ourselves. The mindset of ourselves is where this has to start. So we do need industry expertise, for sure you need it. But that's the start, that's not the end. And you'll see when we come to cycles of innovation, the number one key missing component is industry experts. They're missing because they're busy being industry experts, not busy innovating. And so this usually calls for a repositioning within your organization, or if you're a very small business, a reallocation of your own time. What am I going to focus on? I can't outsource much of my expertise, but I need to leverage it in order to change the operating model of what we do. So we looked at the five change blocks last week. We looked at the mindset and strategy, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Customer engagement, culture, innovation, and technology. And one of the questions that came through last week was, well, 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 where do I start? And it's difficult to say what the journey looks like, other than it kind of is a journey. So what I would say is that while you've got all of these mindset thing, which is the education piece that McKinsey are talking about, transformation, what is our as-is state? Where are we now? 
What are we transferring, transforming into? What is the plan behind that? How do we engage people with that? Competitors, customers, collaborators. How do we create that culture of innovation? Your role is to build the movement and the engine in your business to create the digital mindset is definitely the start and then create a culture of innovation and catch a new business wave, a new opportunity. And COVID-19 is going to create thousands of new business waves, new ways of working. And you then look to ride that wave powered by new and emerging technology. Simply buying the tech off the shelf and digitizing usually is what everybody does as a baseline. What are you going to do on top of that to create new competitive advantage for you and your organization? So I did say a lot of this is to do with mindset and strategy. And I want to spend the next um, six hours going through, (laughs) I'm kidding, I'm going to spend the next 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes going through the two components of this. One is mindset. And the other is strategy. Okay, so we keep saying it's really important that we get the mindset right. How? Where do I start? What do we mean by getting the right mindset? Why am I saying that industry expertise isn't enough? It's because what has happened and what will jolt us into the new world is that the first touch from customers is now 100% digital. COVID-19 has just made almost everything one first touch digital. And it's now got customers and businesses ready that all touches are digital. And when you start to see all touches go digital, well, then new business models can fit into this. How we do things doesn't have to be the way that it once was. The inertia before was caused because this is how business as usual is done. I need to service that, rightly so. So I'm saying here is that the scientist can still be the scientist But the scientist needs to change how she addresses her organization and how she builds that organization. All leaders at all levels of all sizes of businesses need to gain the mindset for the digital economy. Now, here's how I break it down. There's four things. Understanding digital business models. And we're going to take a look at some. We're going to take a look at understanding data. Just Briefly, because we've we've glanced on this before, strategic innovation and what that means and business capabilities of emerging tech. The leader does not need to know how to use a spanner or code on emerging tech, but they do need to understand its business capabilities. It's equivalent to saying a pilot goes to take off and she announces, I've got two blowy machines on my wings. I don't know what they do, but it's okay. I've got an IT guy that does. You wouldn't fly with them. We cannot be taking off after COVID-19 without understanding the business capabilities. No one expects the pilot to be able to change the fuel pump, but she does need to understand its capabilities to take off and land safely. So that's what we mean by the business capabilities of emerging tech. Let's take a look at what happens traditionally. Leaders, managers, and decision makers are operationally incredibly busy. And this happens all the time. And it's not a geographic Irish thing. I do this all over the world. Great. You want to transform your business. I'm delighted. You don't just want to upgrade it. You want to transform it. So that means transforming of your business and your people and how we think. So uh, how much time have you got to dedicate to understanding all of this stuff? Well, I've got one hour. Could maybe push it to two. Could you fit me in after the board meeting? It isn't feasible or viable to consider that the leader leads the transformation, but yet does not understand emerging technology and data and structured innovation and strategic planning using predictive models. That's not allowed anymore. And while leaders will not be replaced by AI and all of this stuff, leaders that understand this will replace those that don't. And you don't learn it in one hour or two hours. It does require some level of dedication. And that's why we said on the introduction to this, transformation for those that want to transform, it needs to be something you want to do. This is not another project layered on top of business as usual. It won't work like that. This is the, this is the new business as usual. We're making the new business as usual. And it's different from the business of old. And the skill is in balancing the business of old as it transforms into the business of new. 
So there are good methods for understanding this. Here's a quick example, business model changes. We're working with a, a firm that makes engines for our airplane. This is the one that the pilot called the blowy machines. Um, my, my stories tie together beautifully here. And the, the challenge that they have is that they're very expensive when adding it to an aircraft and the aircraft is chosen and the engine is chosen. And what they realized is that the customer doesn't want an engine. In fact, the customer wants to fly, but they really only need thrust. They want to just pay for newtons of thrust that come out of this thing. And so they decide they're going to change their business model of, I'm not going to sell you an engine. I'm going to sell you newtons of thrust, fully serviced, fully managed. And when this engine is being utilized, I know about it and I charge you. Well, the interesting thing is that when we started to create this new business model, it becomes much more affordable for the customer. It's linked with the usage that the customer has. But there's a secondary business model creeps out of this. And the secondary business model is many airlines and airplanes don't get the full utilization of the parts, but yet they must be replaced every six months, 12 months, in particular jurisdictions. So if we put little microchips inside the parts, even though we're replacing it because the law says so, in many other jurisdictions, this part is way before its life. And it would have been that that would have been thrown out. So the business starts to look at what happens if we could trade parts? What happens if someone could bid for a part four weeks before it's due to come out based on what it's likely to do in the future, put their bid price on it, buy that part, get it shipped over and allow them to run it in another aircraft as long as it's within the tolerances of what it was created for. Now, all of a sudden, they're starting to build up a second hand market that they're now making more margin on than they are on their newtons of thrust. This wouldn't have happened accidentally. And so the competitors then try to catch up. The competitors are scrambling going, we don't even have machines capable of understanding this, predicting this stuff. How did they make this happen? And it's because it went under the radar for months and months and months. And then as it started to adopt, it grew exponentially. And that's normal with new business models. So exploring new business models and understanding new business models is a core function of transformation, changing the core. The next one we're going to take a look at is strategic innovation. So there are three phases of strategic innovation. There's digitizing, there's this transformational phase, and then there's AI powered. The digitizing, I'm just going to give you a quick example of a law firm that gets everybody onto mobile devices. Everybody has an iPad, everybody's emailed, everybody, so they're mobile and can work from home. They have digitized. But what we find quite frequently in businesses that are regulated, they'll say, well, we can't transform. We can't offer a new business model. We can't do something unique because we're constrained under our regulation. Great. Can I see the page, please? Page of what? The page of regulation that constrains you. It's never there. It's never there. So what the customer demands is, let's just say, to buy property. Where are the deeds of the house? Where is the regulations behind it? Where is the sign-off of this document? Why aren't these things all online? Why aren't these things happening like lightning? The customer demands it. The law firm that can move and bring value to that process and changes the business model are the ones that will win. But yet we fear for our fees and our current business model. The new business model will eat the old business model if it's better. That's when the transformation is happening. And it will be a different set of technologies required in the transformation phase than in the digitizing phase. Can you skip Digitizing and go straight to transformation? No. You can't ask people to innovate when we don't yet have the mindset. When we don't yet have the processes. We don't yet, could you innovate? I can't even get my, my holiday form signed off. What do you mean innovate? So there's a, a reluctance internally. And then when we get to this transformation phase, AI is going to come in as we will see in emerging technologies and change it again. And some businesses, few 
but there are some that are way up at this AI-powered automation end. So if we can't answer these questions, what are we transforming into? What is our as-is state, to-be state? What is the new role of individuals? What resources? What risk? What strategic questions need to be answered? If we don't have those things listed, it's unlikely we're going through transformation. Let's take a look at the understanding data. I'm a consultant, and I want to consult and open up a new consultancy bit practice in either Paris or London. I consult on ISO 9001. So the international standard of ISO 9001, and I'm an auditor, and I want to open up a new audit office. Paris has 32,700 7, 32, registered users. There are 1,300 people per month in Paris looking for ISO 9001. Google, for 170 British pounds, will allow me to buy 4.1% uh, of that audience, and I can get to see what it's like. So this is all coming from Google's advertising platform. But it gives me a second insight when I compare it to London, very similar in terms of its geographic size and uh, the, the demographics. But I can see that there's nearly twice as many people looking for ISO 9001, but I can also see that the competition for bidding for this stuff is twice as high. So it's highly likely that the competition for ISO 9001 in my new office in London, while it's got more people, the competition is fierce. So what do I do? We do experiment. We experiment. We experiment to try to make sense of these numbers, to try to help us get better on indications of what is going on. And an experiment should take a week. What are people looking for? Is it a training manual on ISO 9001? Is it a training course? Is it auditors? Is it to know what the standard is? We don't know that. That's where the experimentation and the innovation comes in. So a learning organization asks these questions, the tools are available, and the data answers them. Without asking the question, the data will not provide. Looking at the stats won't provide. So here's an example. I go in and I look at my own Google Analytics. Looks lovely. What's the question? I get to see that my customers are coming from the United States, United Kingdom, from India, from Germany. I can actually even zoom in to Dublin, and there's 27 from Malahide. Malahide. That's, that's the posh end, isn't it? So the, the number of people that I can see, I can get all of these statistics, but I'm without a question here. So there's no context for me. So it's not really helping me. And where does the question come from? It comes from the strategy. Where does the strategy come from? The leaders. That's it. This all ties together. Let's take a look at business capabilities of emerging technology, and in particular, artificial intelligence. Now, IoT, Internet of Things, blockchain, I get it, they're all big, but there's nothing is going to change the world quite like AI. And so anything, what is, what's going on with AI? What's the big deal here? What's, what's, why is everybody getting so excited? Why is he getting so animated up in Donegal about AI? Anything that has a decision tree and associated data will be aug augmented or replaced by AI quite soon. Now, what do we mean by a decision tree? If you're a manager or a leader or a decision maker, you are forever making decisions based around that industry expertise that we talked about. Quite often you make decisions and you don't really know why you even made the decision, just that you did. But in reality, that decision arrived through logical sequences, decisions and experiences. Once those decisions and experiences can be shared and measured, if there's data at the start, data at the end, and a knowledge graph of what happens in between, the AI can figure out the most efficient way to make the decision. A, a, a general practitioner, a doctor, can be replaced by an AI, yet she makes some really complex decisions based on your family history, your medical records, it, all sorts of things. There's, it's been proven now that you pour the data in at the start and the data in for the outcomes, and AI can predict the symptoms and the problem as well as the doctor can. So 
You then add on top of that that my watch has now got every pulse that I have. The biometrics are starting to get captured on around skin temperature, uh, blood sugar levels. You'll then start to get artificial intelligence predicting what's going to happen to you before it happens. I mean, this makes the AI more valuable than the subject matter expert. So it's going to come in and change everything. So you can wait until it changes or you can start to leverage it. This is an Irish firm that I'm going to tell you about that leverages AI. They provide commodity goods such as disinfectant to hospitals and to shopping centers and everything else. They know from all of the purchases that happen all over the country what the average literage for disinfectant should be per square meter inside the institution. They can spot theft, overusage, spillage inside 500, 600 different units by just taking a look at the square footage, past usage, comparable usage, and predicting what it should be used. And now they're starting to get into the ability to offer not the service of selling disinfectant because it's really competitive, but being able to identify the inefficiencies in the customer's organization. Do you scale that up beyond just disinfectant? We can start to see all of the inefficiencies and league tables across multiple sites and businesses and the provider of the commodity that was always being squeezed in price creates new competitive advantage. I want that efficiency engine that you guys have. I want to start measuring it across my business. No problem. We'll offer you the best price, but you need to offer me it for three years. And let's measure this out. Locked in. So that kind of innovation works in all sizes of business if you understand the business models that can come from it and start to experiment and work with customers to make it happen. Okay. We've taken a look at the four. We're now just going to nip over to strategy. We are right on time, which is so unlike me. This is, this is wonderful. I'm going to take a look at strategy because I said we're going to give you the hard-hitting way to find out where you are and where you can go. We looked at this quadrant last week, but we didn't go into the detail. What happens is a business has a front window. Most businesses have a front window. It's the website. But there's more than that. You've, a website is a front window, but you've digital footprints. What people are saying about you, how they refer to you, how often you release information that people share, we call it bounces. The more innovative, the more the bounce. The more frequency with the greater innovations, the greater the bounce. And that's measurable. When I measure your bounce, I can pretty much tell how your business is built on the inside. And I'm going to show you how to measure your bounce, how to measure your innovation, and then start to plot it onto this quadrant. In fact, we've got a tool. I see that we have 112 people online. I don't know what happens when 112 people go to use the tool, but we'll find out. So we talk about businesses being an advocacy. That means that they have a cold or mild and informed relationship with your customers. You're one of many suppliers. You shake hands, the customers shake hands, you build a relationship over a long period of time. The challenge with that is that your growth profile of this yellow line is quite slow. Why is it slow? Because you can build relationships at the speed of handshakes but they tend to be very certain and solid relationships, really good in the downturn. You can really start to speak and, and, and have empathy with the customer. You then move across that I'm going for, instead of an exclusive or niche audience, I'm going for a mainstream or main market audience. And I can use bought media, paid for advertising. What does that matter? Well, if someone is searching for my business and I'm an advocacy, they want to know about me. When I'm searching and I'm paying for ads, I want to know about the product or service or the itch that you're scratching that I'm looking for. So as long as the ad spend is less than the acquisition of the customer, that may continue. But as industries mature, the cost of acquisition increases beyond a viable amount. And we stop advertising. Our communications in this area is all around product, position, price, ads, Conversion. 
Here, it's about our people. So the people in advocacy role, and you can tell this in your analytics, everybody's going to the About Us page and the Contact Us page. They're not really looking at your product page. Over here, they're looking at the product page and not the About Us page. And so this bears itself out in data. The next one is authority. Look at authority. Look at the growth of authority. Continued, growing, stepping it up. What takes you from the yellow square to authority? Omnipresence. It's earned media. What do I mean by earned media? Everybody's talking about you. Everybody's talking about you. Why would they talk about you? Because you've innovated. You've something new to say, something new to share. So it's not just we sell knives, we have a sharper knife, or we are proud to announce our new CEO and his golf trophy. Ugh. It's not innovation. <laughs> Innovation isn't measured by what we say as business owners. It's by what the customer accepts, shares, promotes, talks about. We get the market draws us. We get asked to speak at events. We're the innovator. We get the phone calls and the inquiries come in from people we've never met or shaken hands with. That happened in advocacy. So moving from advocacy to authority is a good play, but it means we're going to innovate. So you have structures for innovation, a strategy that suits, understand the business capability of emerging technologies and business models. They're all core functions in the head before we make action. Prime is where the big players sit. I, I, I'm not going to do this online, but I usually would ask people, name me the three top flavors of ice cream. Answer that in your head. The world's top three flavors of ice cream are... Vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. If you said that, got that right, have a scoop of each on me. The idea behind this is that most mature industries have big players, and these big players get 50, 60% of market share. If we're not one of the big players, we're getting the crumbs off their table. But a multi billion dollar business, I'll feed nicely on those crumbs. So it doesn't mean that there isn't room. But you can't attack a prime player by not differentiating. You can't make a shampoo and take on the shampoo players. You can't take a, a car tire and take on Pirelli or Michelin or any of those, the, the prime players. You will not displace them. The displacement technique comes from attention, paying for ads, and paying more than them, unlikely, are going from advocacy up to authority Growing, growing, growing in a new wave and innovating. Innovating and publishing, by the way, because my guess is we're going to take a look at the next phase. Many of you are innovators, but you don't publish. You hide your innovations for fear that someone will steal it. My as is state. This is a children looking into a shop window. And I'm going to give you, this is my metaphorical equivalent to what I'm about to ask you to do. It is possible to look through the digital footprint. It's not a measurement of what people say on their website. It's not a measurement of their marketing. It's a measurement of the bounces, their publications, their innovations, and how the industry then shares it. I can look through the window from your outside in. I can look outside in, and I can pretty much tell how the rest of this shop is being run. I'm going to give you a minute. There is a tool called propulsion.ionology.com. There are 109 people on this call at the minute. I don't know what happens when 109 get there. I'm going to get there first. So um, what I'm going to do is I have taken uh, citizens' information, and I have put it in, you see, I have put it in to the propulsion report. I can see from the outside in, not just citizen information, the sub-department government in Ireland, I can see that they score a 40. Now, where does this number come from? We've analysed thousands of businesses. And we've been able to take a look at their inside and then make predictive models using AI as to how likely the characteristics of citizens' information would be compared to other char highly characteristic models of innovators grade C. They're emerging as an innovator. I can see that they're paying for ads so that they're in the attention quadrant. And now I've got a number 
or my as is state. Any, could somebody put a question up there? Is, uh, is it working? I, I've never tested it with 100 people live. I usually do this in ones, twos, fives, not 100. So if it's not working, please please post it on there. You might have to wait in a little bit of a queue on the server. It does a lot of analysis. But the reason I'm showing you this is most businesses, yes, seems to be working. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Stephen. Seems to be working. Most businesses have this idea that we're innovators because I remember the thing we did last week. Remember that? That was innovative. But in the digital economy, the customer doesn't know this. In the digital economy, the customer actually doesn't care less. The customer cares about me, 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 me. Oh, and one other person, me. That's it. And so we now have propulsion will say, you may be an innovator. It's not to insult you, but your outside in has this as a, as a set of circumstances. Now, remember, 100s are the Googles, the Apples, the the. Wikipedia's the big players, but it will allow you to get a really good understanding of where you are inside the quadrant. If your play is that you're in advocacy or your attention, your desire is really to get above the x-axis, to make a move which is common from advocacy to authority. We would suggest that you take a wave of change in your business and couple it with an emerging technology. Look for a new customer problem to solve, of which there are now hundreds. And when you are able to see what these new opportunities are, you can now start to define your 2B state. I want to become the industry authority for this new wave because we're going to do what better than anyone else? And then you have to refine that focus. Now, refining the focus. Here's the hard bit. Here's the real hard bit. Let's just take a look at it. I'm going to talk about a little fruit company. You may have heard of them before, called Apple. And Apple, back in the day, in 1998, Steve Jobs came back to Apple. And he said, I'm going to get rid of everything we do, which I don't advocate. You don't need to do that. But he did. The business was going bankrupt. He couldn't de define the uniqueness of Apple and said, unless we are unique in this economy, I don't want to know. I'm not playing. He borrowed a few hundred million from Microsoft to keep the business afloat. And they set about creating this beauty, the iMac. Now, the iMac was different in its day for a number of reasons. because. Back then, you had Gateway, Dell, um, all of these ads were appearing in newspapers, and they talked about RAM, ROM, keyboards, number of keys on the keyboard, the CD-ROM drive, the serial port. I mean, they just listed specifications. And Apple didn't. Apple kept a very, very narrow value proposition. And they innovated around its design and around this idea that it would manage your life or your digital life better. Here's an ad from the time. And what I respect the most about this ad, what I love so much about this ad, is their ability to say one thing that was better than everyone else and then shut up, shut up. Now in a changing and evolving business, that's very hard because Joseph, so he thinks you're about to axe his department because he used to be the figurehead. So politically, internally, this is difficult. But in the mind of the customer, you can't go talking about the same thing everybody else is doing. So let's just take a look at, uh, look at the ad. Presenting three easy steps to the internet. Step one, plug in. Step two, get connected. Step three. <laughs> There's no step three. There's no step three. <laughs> Jeff Goldblum was the narrator. Um, <laughs> I was with Enterprise Ireland in New York once, 
in a hotel and I could hear what it sounded like Jeff Goldblum behind me. And I looked around and it was, and he was in the gym and he was just saying, I forgot my running shoes and he was in cowboy boots and borrowed shorts. That's etched on my mind. It'll never, it'll never leave me. Anyway, back to Apple. Apple managed to keep that very narrow value proposition. They moved to authority. They moved up to authority and took out this whole new stake of ease and simplicity, and they attracted new users, people who wouldn't have typically connected to the internet. They just made it that anybody can do it, and that was the pain that they solved. Very simple pain, but yet everybody was overcomplicating the solution. And they kept their nerve. And of course, they then grew and grew the iPod, the iPad, iTunes, iLife. And of course, they then came across Nokia. Now, when they came across Nokia, Nokia had 64 phones in the market. They had one of three different RAM sizes. At the time they took Nokia out, this was the front page of Forbes magazine. It said it was one year before Nokia collapsed. One billion customers. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? 18 months later, they had been gone through chapter 11. They were bankrupt and I think acquired by Microsoft. So the ability to be in prime position and to be displaced by an innovator is the route that happens. Apple are almost impossible to displace because they are also an innovator. They have a culture of innovation. They keep innovating. They've built the primacy of brand and they're very aware that they get attacked from one side and from below. Talking about getting attacked from below, from the tension, Samsung comes at, Mike, uh, at Apple and the same year Apple put $4 billion into buying real estate and building Apple stores, Samsung put in $6 billion with an operating system borrowed from Google and the handset that they made in order to attack Apple. Now, some might say that Apple let them in because they couldn't remain a monopoly forever. But if we take a look at what happened then in that mobile phone market, Apple and Samsung are increasingly dominant in mobile phones. Apple and Samsung continue to soak up the industry's profits. McCord says Apple claimed 87.4% of phone earnings before interest and taxes in the fourth quarter, he said. Samsung took 32.2% of industry profits because their combined earnings were higher than industry's total earnings as a result of many vendors losing money in Q4, Apple and Samsung mathematically accounted for more than 100% of the industry's earnings. Now, I don't know if you can do that mathematically. I'm not an accountant. It does seem dubious to me. But the point is well made. The strategic play of Apple from small pip to large orchard was planned by Steve Jobs. He said in an interview, and we, we put this in uh, yes, last week's webinar, he said in an interview, I'm going to sit back and wait for the next wave of change to come, and then I'm going to strike with my new emerging technology that, uh, to that essence. The wave of change is here. What's your strike? What's your play? What's your business model? Question, how do leaders give themselves the space to transform their own mindset before changing their own business? Anthony McCauley, that is a wonderful question. And it goes right back to the heart of what we were saying at the start. Do you want to transform? And at the very start, we said there was two people shaking hands. Yes, I've got two hours to do it. Then don't. You don't have the capacity to transform. You have the capacity to digitize not transform. This takes leaders, managers, and decision makers deciding that this is a new journey, a new way of doing it, and we need to spend some time understanding the whole landscape and how the game has changed. Traditional businesses never had to do this. The digital innovators, many of them, do it by default. How do you know if you've got the resources? Well, here's an interesting one. I'm going to ask you how much time money, cash, and leadership talent do you have to spare? I always love doing this. I come into a boardroom and I say, how much time, talent, and cash have you got? And around the boardroom, everybody looks at each other, kind of like this. Is he asking me for money because he's going to take the money? And if I tell him how much money we've got, we're going to lose all the money. And what about my talent? Is he going to take it? No one really trusts the question. 
But there's a reason, poor old cat. There's a reason for this question. Because each one of these quadrants does have a greater pull on resources. So, Anthony, your question was timely. If you only have, so I talk about talent as leadership talent. You know, those subject matter experts that we talked about at the start. If you're going to stay in advocacy, just get people to spend time. They don't have to be subject matter experts. They build the relationships. They don't have to be, don't have that level of expertise. You don't need much in the way of cash for your advertising. You build your relationships. If you're going to go across for attention and remember the graph for attention, let me just remind everybody again, the graph for attention can go up while the going is good, but it will break when the market gets too saturated. If you're going to go for it, it requires cash. If you decide we're going to go for this journey north from advocacy to authority, you need the leaders to be on board. You need them to be able to set aside one, two days a week just to understand this, to upgrade themselves, to reposition, to get the cultural change going in the organization. And when you're prime, actually, you don't need as much leadership talent involved. You pay cash to defend from a tax coming from below, and you use the time to just continuously build the relationships. It's a position of defense. Prime is a position of defense, but naturally, business models ebb away. You need to bring your new one up. We are able to take questions if there are, if there are any questions that you would like to ask. Mary Cullinan, any examples of consultancy advisory in the authority zone? Uh, there are, Mary, uh, you, consultancy and advisory businesses, specialist businesses are the ones that definitely get into there, though, those that, that have taken out the niche and specialism. So we've got to remember that when we talk about authority, you're coming through this gateway here, which is a niche play. So even though the market might be large and you want to become the number one consultancy and management consultancy, you won't. Deloitte, KPMG, PwC, uh, EY, they own that space. You can't displace them from it. You need to get a niche, and there are thousands of niches, thousands of niches, and new niches being brought every day. You then become an authority and do what Apple did. You become an authority in that, and then you expand adjacencies. Expand, 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 and usually what happens is the prime players try to acquire at that stage. Do you share the slides? Jared, I don't share the slides. Although saying that, there is a video, and I do believe the video from last week is online now. It went online this afternoon on YouTube, on the YouTube channel of, um, a, of Technology Ireland. And this, will be, this is recorded and this will also be online. There's a reason for this. One is that I write books and I sell the books. And we also have a course that's coming up, a much more detailed course than this. It's going to be heavily subsidized by, by the government. Um, it is going to be available where we're going to go into this in much more detail, take much more detailed questions, and actually take a look at how we then take this and map it a little bit further. And um, there'll be more coming up on that later, but um, we try to give as much value as we can here, but there, there are PET4 courses later that come in under this. Peter, um, you mentioned at one point about artificial intelligence. Doctors can be replaced. Could I change change the statement and say doctors' decisions uh, can be augmented by artificial intelligence. You certainly can. You certainly can. That's a very good point. The, the, I've actually been doing a lot of research. I'm writing a new book on artificial intelligence and the impact it will have on business. And triage is being tried whereby an AI will do the triage. You ask questions around the decision tree, and it, it then tries to compare what the diagnosis is from the computer than what it is from the doctor. But here's the point that I would make, Peter. You're, there is, it's not turn off the doctors, throw them out, and let's move to AI. But what will soon happen is that a doctor is used to diagnose an, exi an existing condition that you have presented with. Where with AI, the AI will predict your problem before it happens. So my smartwatch, my, my heartbeat, my rate, all of these biosensors IP, IPU, all of those things will be analyzed. When those things come through and a computer is able to predict it, the role of the doctor will definitely have to change. It won't be the same. You will not be going presenting symptoms. You will be going with the data that is predicted. These are the symptoms you're going to get. And I think that's, that's very, very close. That, that's going to be a game changer. But in that meantime, the doctors, of course, will use it. But 
this career of a GP as we once understood it, a lifelong career, you just go through your seven years, you become a GP, you can stay there for life. Mm, not so sure anymore. Same with accountants, same with lawyers, same with anybody that has the decision tree associated with their business. So what have we got here? Um, Deborah Loughran, um, now when starting out, is it possible to attain enough data sources free or a minimum cost that would could Im that impact or do you have to pay big for data? No, I, Deborah, I'm not going to go into it. May 19th, be there or be square uh, or be the square root of something that is square. So we, we, you, you don't, Deborah, no, to answer that question. Alan Rafferty, how can you convince the leaders to transform? That's a million dollar one. Um, um, usually what happens, if you remember last week, we start to find ourselves in a competitive disadvantage or struggling to differentiate. And that is symptomatic of its time to change. If the pressure has been put on to salespeople or if you're in government and the feedback from citizens isn't good, or you're in a charity and the donations are going down, that kind of indication, it usually makes it easier to convince. But the time to actually transform is when things are high because a, as a company, Macaulay had asked earlier on, how do you get the resources? Well, when you've got the cash and reserves, it makes it easier than when your back is against the wall and every euro counts. Billy, uh, Billy Goodburn just makes a statement here, says digital mindset is definitely not at the forefront. I, I agree, um, but I think this is why McKinsey are saying it, um, that it's something that should be. Any roadmap to oneself to digitally transform its own career? Um, Marcelo, um, I don't know. You know, I, There's certainly no shortage of of education out there. There's certainly no shortage of good courses to take. Um, you know, career in what? Um, but yes, certainly these skills, these core skills are paramount, I think, for the future. As I said, leaders won't be replaced by AI or emerging tech, but those that understand AI and emerging tech will replace those that don't. You can't hold it off. It can't, it can't be held off. Um, there are other webinars that are coming up that Technology Ireland have got going here the 5th of May, 12th of May. And thank you very much all for watching. The video will be live on YouTube within a week um, and you will be able to go back and refer to it then. And I do hope that you will join us at the deeper course in May. I think it's going to be over three half days where we're going to be going into each one of these sections much more deeply. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this webinar, please follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn to be kept up to date with all our news, events and programmes. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos like this one.